Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member FDIC. The T-Biz Podcast delivers T-News that you need to know. A recap of the week's major headlines with commentary and cultural trends hosted by Dan Bolton. It is the voice of origin for tea professionals and enthusiasts worldwide. Think of us as a digital caravan of storytellers, bringing authentic, authoritative, and exclusive stories to you weekly from the tea lands. Hello, everyone. Here are the headlines. Cold brew is trending for iced tea bunt. David's Tea in Canada settles its debts, and Kenya exports surge, but auction prices remain low. More in a minute, but first, this important message. Avani empowers rural women practicing sustainable agriculture, including tea and crafts, such as weaving with natural fiber and plant-based dyes. Up in the towering Himalayas, Kuman is one of India's oldest tea regions. Today, we raise our cups in the name of Avani Kuman, a nonprofit dedicated to strengthening farming communities. Cheers to a brighter future for all. To donate, visit avani kumanorg Cold brew convenience is the answer to summer heat during ice tea month. The challenge of correctly steeping a delicate green tea to avoid bitterness disappears when the tea is brewed overnight in the fridge. Quote, I'm cutting calories and want something more flavorful than water, begins one Reddit thread. Can you explain to a total cold brew newbie how to get the most flavorful green tea without additives? The responses were enthusiastic and numerous evidence that the technique rivals more traditional fresh-brewed, flash-chilled black tea. Whether boiling tea to pour over ice or making cold brew, the tea-to-water ratio is critical. Begin with about twice the normal amount of tea, 6 to 8 tablespoons for 1.5 quarts or 8 to 12 grams per 950 milliliters. Stale tea requires more leaves. Quality leaf requires fewer. Make sure your vessel is airtight as tea will pick up the scent of leftovers. Allied Market Research estimates RTD tea generated $30 billion in 2019 and will grow 5.5% annually to $39 billion in 2027. Health-conscious millennials are driving sales. Mintel reports that 25% of new tea innovations are RTD. In China, where 78% of consumers are frequent drinkers of freshly brewed hot tea, RTD enjoys 49% penetration, which is greater than tea bags, according to Mintel. Business Insight Cold Brew Coffee experienced remarkable five-year growth in both bottled ready-to-drink and food service. North America is the largest cold brew coffee market globally with 66% market share. This is followed by Europe with 17% and Asia at 11%. In the U.S., 2015 sales of cold brew coffee are expected to rise tenfold from 110 million to 945 million in 2025, according to Statista Market Research. 360 market research estimates the market globally will reach 2.8 billion by 2026. David's Tea settles its debts. A Quebec Superior Court approved the Montreal based tea company's plan to settle 118 million in claims with 18 million payable in July. 
The U.S. Bankruptcy Court this week approved a similar plan for resolving debts owed by David Stee, U.S. subsidiary. The settlements are a final step towards exiting a year-long reorganization precipitated by the closure of all but 18 of the company's more than 200 locations. The settlement will be divided with approximately $15.3 million going to Canadian creditors and $3.5 million to U.S. creditors, according to Price Waterhouse Coopers Canada. The company has sufficient cash on hand to meet settlement obligations. Under the direction of CEO Sarah Siegel, David Stee has adopted a digital-first marketing strategy for sales to consumers. Its wholesale products are now found in 2,500 grocery and pharmacy outlets. The company reported sales of $40.2 million in fourth quarter 2020. Revenue from the fast-growing online and wholesale segment has increased from $42 million in 2019 to $97 million in 2020. Greatly reduced brick-and-mortar revenue now accounts for only 12.9% of total sales. Revenue overall declined 38% in 2020, leading to $55.9 million in losses. Kenya tea exports surge. Despite upheaval at the factory level, Kenya exported much higher tea volumes this year. First quarter exports increased 18.9% compared to 2020, according to the National Tea Directorate. Volume topped 153 million kilos, up from 128 million during the same period in 2020. Smallholders that produce 65% of the country's tea experienced variable weather conditions in 2021, creating an overall decline in production during the first three months. Growers, primarily in the far west, harvested 18 million fewer kilos since January. Auction prices are on the rise, reaching $1.84 per kilo last week, but they remain well below the $2 per kilo threshold considered essential to cover production costs. Weekly prices so far this year averaged $2 only once. Tea prices averaged $1.80 per kilo in 2020, down from an average of $2.05 per kilo in 2019. Business Insight Kenya's tea growers are benefiting from timely direct payment thanks to national reforms instituted this spring. In past years, it was common for farmers to wait two months for payment after deliveries to the Kenya Tea Development Authority factories. Payments are now immediate. Aravinda and Antheraman in Bengaluru reports on India's tea auction prices. India Tea Price Report for the week ending 12th June 2021. Even as the second flush is underway, the mood remains glum as the industry continues to deal with the many challenges. Local media reports have been on rising imports of tea into India. In Darjeeling, producers have expressed a lot of concern about zero-duty imports from Nepal. Kaushik Basu, secretary of the Darjeeling Tea Association, has asked for stringent checks for quality of the teas coming in. The association has also asked the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India to step up these checks. In terms of production, so far Assam and West Bengal combined for the period January to May 2021, have reported a decrease in production by 60 to 70 million kilos when compared with 2019. However, prices remain firm and expectations are high for the months of June, July and August. Meanwhile, on COVID, the downward curve of the second wave has begun but only just in some parts of the country. In the Nilgiris, up until early June, the daily caseload was on an upward curve. A decrease in daily caseload is hoped for in a week's time. In prices... Last week saw Orthodox tea fare better than CTC in terms of volume sold. In the south, Cochin saw good demand for Orthodox tea, while CTC dust saw fair demand, with Supply Co and InkoServe playing the part. In North India, Kolkata saw good demand for CTC and Orthodox, with Middle East and CIS countries active for Orthodox teas. Only 53% of Darjeeling on offer was sold. Tata Consumer Products and Hindustan Unilever were active in Guwahati, which saw good demand. And now... A word from our sponsor. 
Trade Tees works with tea purveyors at every scale, from promising startups to the world's largest multinational beverage brands in the hot, iced, and bottled tea segments. With U.S.-based formulation, blending, and packaging services, Q-Trade can help you innovate, scale up, and grow your specialty tea brand. For more information, visit our website, QTradeTees.com. Tea Biz This Week travels to Columbus, Ohio, to visit with Amy Dubin-Noth, founder of Jatam Tea, and an ad hoc India tea ambassador to the U.S. I went to Portland, Oregon, where Ravi Croson, head tea maker at Smith Tea Maker, explains the many uses of tea at the company's recently opened plant-based cafe. Amy Dubin Noth sees a bright future for specialty tea originating in India. But I don't think it is going to be a quick flip where people are only after high-end teas, she says. Instead, the process will be gradual, following a path similar to wine. Do I want to see the spectacular teas of India keep selling at a high price, she asks? Yes, definitely, as that elevates the perceived value, making it something precious. I believe that message should be spread throughout the world, including India. Are single origin whole and broken leaf the teas of the future? Oh, that is that is such a fantastic question. I love talking about the future of tea because everything is possible in the future, right? When it comes to the future of tea, I see a broader range. We have to have tea at, at every level, but the challenge is, is that we have been exposed as a culture, as a society, to teas of a certain style, of a certain grade, of a certain color. It creates a certain expectation. If you like Lipton tea, great, drink it. I'm happy for anybody to drink tea. But there are other styles. There are other places that tea comes from. There's other experiences that you can have. And I think the near-term future of Indian tea is in the excitement and curiosity around exploring India's most spectacular teas. I foresee in the next 15, 20 years that that people will become, have more facility with the language of tea, will really have more clarity around what they're buying and be intentional about buying. Oh, I want these health benefits, or I want this or that, and and be able to discern that in the grocery store. I personally, in my professional experience, do not believe we're there yet. So I think it'll take a little bit of time to start expanding people's horizons and giving them more choices and some more opportunities with tea to taste fine and specialty teas. The new president of Packaged Tea at Tata Consumer Products in April, introduced a premium line sold exclusively online and marketed exclusively to India's domestic consumers. Tata's 1868 tea in 50-gram tins sells for between 500 and 1,500 rupees, about $20 U.S. The company reports that sales grew by 59.6% in value and 23% in volume since January. The thought that one person has only one tea and they only drink one tea, 10 cups a day, their whole life, um, that does happen. That does definitely does happen. But more and more, when there's more opportunity to taste, people want different flavors. It's just like, uh, you know, women preferring to wear red one day or yellow another day. It's just, you just want novelty. And However, I don't know that you can attribute all of that to the desire for tea itself. Sometimes people want the best of the best just because it's the best and it doesn't matter what it is. And sometimes people want something that looks really posh because it's a really special gift and it's a really special thing. And it's like, wow, this is, this is tea and it's just like lovely. You can have all of the best, most gorgeous packaging in the world and the best tea in the world, but the tea and the experience of tea are inextricable. 
The cool thing about Indians is they know what tea is. They already have a flavor expectation. They already understand uh, what it is. But when it comes to long leaf, loose leaf tea, a whole leaf tea, most of that's been exported to Western countries. Do I want them to keep selling at a high price? Yes, definitely. Because what it does is it elevates the, the value, the perceived value of Indian tea as something that is precious. And it is. And I believe that message should be spread throughout the world and including in India. Will you discuss the pivot to online by tea retailers and the popularity of suppliers selling direct to consumers and share your expertise in marketing tea? To share with you a little bit about what's happening in India, there's something in Assam alone, like 100,000 small leaf producers. Now, there are several smaller areas, gardens, where people are making tea and making experimental tea and some fantastic stuff. The only outlet that I am aware of for small growers to have a marketplace is through a website called T-Orb, T-E-A-O-R-B. And T-Orb guarantees their tea to be fresh and gets it to consumers as close to direct to the from the producers as possible. Uh, it's a very new operation uh, just within the last couple of years, but there really isn't anything that is pervasive, government-backed, large organizations that are um, stepping up to really um, promote the produce from small producers. So far as I know, in India, T-Orb is groundbreaking, and I don't know of any other marketplace for small growers. Amy, will you tell listeners about your talk next week at World Tea Expo? This is going to be a very interesting week for me because I'm speaking at the World Tea Expo and the Global Summit for All Things Food, a completely separate show at the MGM Grand a couple days later. The uh, World Tea Expo talk is here's all the things I love about Indian tea talk. Indian tea, I feel, has been a little bit underrepresented at World Tea Expo. So my goal in uh, going is to share with people how I got into it, how I developed my love for Indian tea over 20 years ago, how and why I changed my life to uh, basically be a de facto brand ambassador for Indian tea in North America is that people don't realize they've been drinking Indian tea and they think of Indian tea as being masala chai and are unaware that India produces so many different styles and types and varieties. Amy's expo talk is titled The Wild Expanse of Indian Tea. Hang on to your taste buds. It's at 1 p.m. Tuesday, June 29th. Two days later, at the Global Summit for All Things Food, Amy will accept an award as one of the 100 most influential food and beverage professionals. The intent of the new cafe concept, says Smith tea maker Ravi Kosen, is to develop foods that really reflect our ethos of plants as well as utilizing tea as an ingredient. The new Smith Tea Maker Cafe sources locally with a menu that includes snacks, lattes, and ice concoctions with full meals that demonstrate how tea and food can live in harmony from leaf to cup. The perfect cup of tea is one shared with others. This quote by legendary tea entrepreneur Stephen Smith adorns oak paneling of Smith Tea Maker's new cafe in Portland, Oregon. It's a cafe with a tea twist. The plant-based menu features dishes and snacks infused with the company's premium tea. Culinary director Carl Hall developed the food menu, working with head tea maker Ravi Crozen and Smith's Tea Lab. Beets roasted in jasmine tea, quinoa cooked in sencha, croissant filled with peppermint tea infused chocolate. Ravi, these all sound divine. What are these culinary delights? These are all things that are 
that we have started offering in our new plant-based cafe up on Northwest 23rd in, in Portland, Oregon. The concept really is to further the being a plant-based company, further that concept in terms of developing um, foods that really reflect our ethos of, of plants as well as utilizing tea as an ingredient. What flavor combinations of tea and food delighted you the most? I really personally like the sheep's cheese that was used to make our white petal cheese. Now, taking the the sheep cheese from a local partner, Carl was very specific in terms of working with local partners um, for a lot of the things. So chocolate, salt, you know, the baked goods, those kinds of things were all very specifically sought out to have local partners that would work with us. So with the, the sheep's cheese itself, that's comes from Black Sheep Creamery. And we basically blend in white petal, which is our uh, sort of floral, slightly fruity uh, white tea. Um, and it just creates this incredible sort of new experience. Fat, as you may or may not know, works in this process called enfleurage, where it takes on uh, aromas very easily. So the fat in the cheese really brings in all those flavors that you find in drinking that tea. So they're expressed very cleanly through and we use that in a, a couple different uh, aspects at the space and, and one in a bowl that is just a delight to eat. I imagine this process was filled with experimentation in your lab. Carl, spearheading this again, uh, worked with my team to uh, fine tune a lot of these concepts. He had had already, some of these dishes were quite well worked out, but there were some that just needed some fine tuning. And, and with our help, uh, you know, kind of guiding and offering suggestions on how to best achieve the final outcome of a really wonderful dish, we work together to create a wonderful menu. And again, you know, our, my team is, was, was integral in that, but certainly Carl is the genius in this whole process and, and the driver. You just opened at the end of May, but can you share what menu item has been a popular choice so far and what you think it is about that item that's attracting customers? We have a turmeric noodle bowl. You know, having uh, turmeric on the menu is such a recognizable ingredient. You've seen a rise in consumption in turmeric-based teas over the last five years. There is a understanding in the consumer consciousness on a broader scale now for of, of turmeric being a beneficial and healthy ingredient. So, you know, leading with that as part of the overall makeup of that dish allows for people just to immediately get what they're buying. That shows that we're People that are coming to buy food at Smith as well as drink teas are health conscious as well as uh, looking looking for new and exciting experiences. What is your personal favorite item on this lovely menu? Now's your chance to entice us all to visit Portland. I really do like the uh, masala chai spiced uh, cinnamon sugar bun. If you peel it off each layer and eat them bit by bit, you can really get the experience of how well the masala chai is built into that baked good. And I love to pair that specifically with our black lavender latte, which is actually brewed using an espresso machine or what like we like to call it a tea espresso machine. And what that does is the high pressure combined with the heat creates a large, large amount of uh, dissolved and suspended solids in the brew, which give a much thicker, richer experience. Hence the use of, you know, that was the intention of espresso machines from the beginning is to create this viscous quality to the brew that you can't quite get from brewing it in different ways. So adding that black lavender latte, and we use a little bit of oat milk to top that off, is just a, such a delight and pairs so well with uh, the, the masala chai morning bun. The cafe is located in Portland's Northwest 23rd District, the same neighborhood where the company was founded in 2009 by the late tea maker Stephen Smith. Visit smithtea.com to learn more. Intrigued by what you heard in today's podcast? Would you like to learn more from our global network of tea biz journalists and tea experts? Contact them directly through Subtext, a private message-based platform. Avoid the chaos of social media and start a conversation that matters. Subtext's message-based platform lets you privately ask meaningful questions of the tea experts, academics, and tea biz journalists reporting from the tea lands. You see their responses via SMS texts, which are sent direct to your phone. Visit our website and subscribe to Subtext to instantly connect with the most connected people in tea. Remember to visit the Tea Biz website for more comprehensive coverage. That's www.t-bizbiz.com. 
Thanks for listening. Farewell till next week.